Hi, everyone. Uh, my name is Christine Walk. Welcome to our webinar. I am Director of Client Partnerships with IDP Connect here in Canada, and I'm also a proud GlowEd board member. So thank you for joining our session today. And I wanted to give a quick shout out and thank you to our sponsors, M Squared Media, and to Sony, our uh, tech support, who's coming to us from India and it is 1 a.m. So a huge thanks uh, to you for supporting us and all of our technology needs today. We really appreciate it. So to kick things off for our presentation, how to motivate and engage, engage and inspire remote international teams, I'd like to introduce my esteemed colleagues or let them introduce themselves. Lori, I'll pass it over to you first. Thanks, Christine. Hello, everybody. Thank you for joining us today. My name is Lori Robinson. I'm the Director of International Partnerships and Business Development at Thompson Rivers University in Kamloops, uh, BC. I've been working in post-secondary for over 20 years in British Columbia, and I spent four years actually as the Director of Marketing for ISAF, so uh, lots of experience working from home and leading global teams. Over to you, Diana. Thank, Thank you, Lori. Thank you, Lori. So yes, my name is Diana Mokute, and uh, currently I am executive director with Gas Canada Partnerships and Business Development. I've been in this industry for now over 10 years, um, working, I mean, as a team member, managing teams. So really look forward for this discussion today. Thank you. And a, a very quick bio for me. So I have been in uh, the higher education sector for almost 17 years now, wow. Um, 12 of those were in the public sector at Conestoga um, in Waterloo Region, Conestoga College. In my final role there, I was Director of International and IELTS. Um, and in my current role, I oversee the IDP Canada team. So we work with clients across the country in student placement um, and digital marketing and, and consulting. So thrilled to get a chance. I've, I've been leading teams for the past almost 10 years and thrilled to get a chance to have this really um, important discussion today. So a little bit about our session. Um, with or without COVID-19, uh, I think we know and we can all agree that remote relationships are here to stay um, in our daily working lives. And over the last year, we've learned from our successes and failures throughout the challenge of COVID-19. And we've really developed some new understandings and tools uh, that we'd like to discuss and share today. So whether you're joining um, an organization um, or heading up or working on a team where there are absolutely no opportunities for interactions in person, it's very challenging. Um, and we'd like to share some of the approaches that have worked well for us on our respective teams and explore some of our pitfalls and things that have worked less well for us as we've in real time navigated this challenge of working remotely across um, often time zones, cultures, um, and uh, business units. So I'm gonna kick things off by really setting the stage by talking about creating a culture of engagement, um, hence the title, and, and really having a team that's based on trust, a team that's inspired and high performing. So um, Google did a massive two year study on performance, which revealed that the highest performing teams have one thing in common, and that's psychological safety. So this is the first thing that we need um, to really create that high performing culture. So what is psychological safety? So psychological safety is defined as being able to show and employ oneself without fear of negative consequences of self image, of st your status, your career. In other words, psychological safety means that your team members, you and your team members feel accepted and respected in their current roles. Um, this, this notion of psychological safety was first introduced by organizational behavioral scientist named Amy Edmondson, who coined the phrase and defined it as a shared belief held by team members that this team is safe for interpersonal risk taking. Um, so that really describes a climate where it's based, the team culture is based on that trust and mutual respect in which people are simply comfortable being themselves. So that's easily said, but how do you create psychological safety within teams? Trust is at the sort of the bedrock and the core fundamental of creating uh, a psychologically safe team. The team really needs to believe deep down 
not just sort of, that they won't be punished when they make a mistake. They can share their ideas, they can share their criticisms, they can question, and they can share it up, sideways, down, and they just simply won't be punished. And that team really isn't there, I think, without that fundamental bedrock of trust. So studies um, show that psychological safety allows for moderate risk-taking. So calculated risk-taking, you can try something new, you can speak your mind, you're not frightened to stick your neck out, you can, um, and it improves creativity. All of these behaviors lead to market breakthroughs and the type of innovations that organizations need, particularly in times like this, when we've been forced into such radical um, change and this sort of digital transformation that the education sector has been thrust into this past year. So it's both, this is both vital to success of a team, um, but particular when we're in such an uncertain environment like now. And what's interesting is that our brains, you know, process threats. So whether that's from a, a, a bear chasing us or a saber tooth tiger or a boss or a coworker threatening us. So sort of like condescending, belittling behavior. Um, the amygdala process, process it with that fight or flight response. So it's in this environment where we really need our teams to be calm um, and, uh, and using analytical reasoning and creativity and taking emotional risks. In fact, when people don't feel safe, they do the exact opposite. So they either fight, become defensive to criticism, shut down, hide mistakes, withdraw, don't share ideas. Um, or they, they flight, so that's just the hiding response. So as they said in this article, this HBR article I was reading, quite literally when we need it most, when we don't feel safe, we literally lose our minds. So, um, and it, it really handicaps that strategic thinking in workplaces. So what we really wanna be looking at in building this sort of inspired, engaged team is a broaden and build perspective or broaden and build mode of thinking. And that's building positive emotions, which really allows us, research shows it really allows us to solve complex problems and foster really trust, trusting cooperative relationships. So when we build in our teams positive emotions like trust, curiosity, confidence, and inspiration, these actually broaden our minds and help us build psychological, social, and physical resources. We become more open-minded we become more resilient, we become more motivated and persistent when we uh, feel safe. Humor increases, thank goodness. So you feel comfortable, you can actually have fun and be playful in the workplace. Um, as does solution finding and divergent thinking, which is the cognitive um, process that underlies creativity. So how uh, do we do this? Oh, one more thing that, that I was actually reading about in preparation of this, when we have this sort of positive, trusting, safe environment, now it's not without accountability. So we don't want to think that we're just having a, a love in here and that there's no accountability um, or ability for teams to really look critically at our work and always be seeking to improve it. So rethinking our work, taking risks, we need that. We need that clarity and accountability in our role defined, a role definition. But when we have that... Um, um, when we have that psychological safety, um, it just really allows us to build that oxytocin in our brain and that produces that trust that we need. So the ultimate question is, and I'll just give you a few, few tips here, a few of the tips from uh, that research shows helps and, and some examples that I use with my team. And then we'll open it up to a couple of questions from Lori and Diana. So how can you um, increase psychological safety on your team? One, you can approach conflict as a collaborator, not as an adversary. So people hate losing more than we love winning. So we will seek to actually avoid losing something more than we will seek to win something. So that kind of loss, perceived loss, causes us to reestablish fairness through competition, criticism, or disengagement. And I think we can all remember times in the workplace where perhaps we've had a defensive team member where everything's always somebody else's fault or if they had a better portfolio, they'd be able to achieve their target. Or if they weren't in the same stupid office they've been in with no light for 10 years, they'd be a more productive member of their team. Whatever the thing is, we've all met people who find those very defensive 
um, who, who find themselves in defensive modes of being. Um, but when we approach conflict as a collaborator and we, we approach it with curiosity rather than, um, you know, pointing fingers, and we, re we avoid that fight or flight response. So we wanna not put people in that place where they feel threatened and that they're gonna lose something where they immediately get defensive. The other thing that I think is super simple but sometimes overlooked um, is really speaking human to human. And I like to say, um, it's like listening between the lines. So what are, when we're engaging with our colleagues on our team, what are our colleagues and our partners and our uh, clients really trying to say to us? What do they actually need? So that's listening between the lines. We're not always saying exactly what's on our mind. Um, and underlying every single one of us, we have the same fundamental needs. So that's respect, competence, social status, and autonomy. So recognizing that each of our team members underlying fundamental needs are those things. It, it, and when we acknowledge that and talk about that and try to bring that out in them, it actually um, naturally elicits trust and it promotes positive language and behaviors. Um, so for those, some people on some teams have difficulty with empathetic communication. And I've seen that where someone on a team perhaps speaks in, is a con we've all been spoken to as if we've been condescended to, or we see someone speaking to a client where they feel almost, again, condescending. So helping people with empathetic communication can really help this internally and of course externally. And so there's a game that, that's been recommended for this that's called Just Like Me. So that's where really asking team members that struggle with this kind of empathetic understanding communication to, to look at the other person and try to understand that this person has beliefs, needs, perspectives, just like me. They have anxieties and vulnerabilities, just like me. They have friends, family, et cetera, just like me, to try and really get them to drop that defensiveness and be present with, with other people. Um, the other thing that you can do with, I think a difficult, um, with a more defensive, less open team member is anticipate for those ones, um, possible responses and reactions and plan accordingly. I think this is where some of the coaching tools comes in handy of um, acknowledging, validating and mirroring what people are saying to you. So for example, um, a, a, a team member has a conflict and instead of getting into the story with them, it's really like mirroring is really just saying the last three words that somebody said. So it sounds really frustrating that you feel like you can't trust your boss because she's always telling you to just get the work done. You don't really feel understood. Is that right? That's right, I do feel really frustrated. That really lowers people's defenses and allows people to open up. The other thing that you can do is just really acknowledge and validate. Um, it must be, and so an example would be, it must be really frustrating that you haven't met your sales goals the last two targets. I can see how frustrating that must be for you. And you maybe you even feel a bit worried um, that you won't be able to meet your next quarter. Does that make sense to you? And this really allows people to feel heard and for them to start to relax. Um, so, uh, and then finally, I think I touched on this before, but it is really replacing blame in the workplace with curiosity. So get yourself into a centered, non-judgmental non place before meetings and one-on-ones, even when you're perhaps talking about difficult material, um, difficult situations in the workplace, and stay out of the story. But really, um, you know, the research really shows that blame and criticism reliably escalate conflict, leading to, again, that defensiveness and disengagement. So again, here the another opportunity to be curious and people are better at solving, they know how to solve their own problems. We all know if given the opportunity, what we need to do. But I think that if we lead with curiosity and non-judgmentalness and help people find their own road um, to solving a problem and ask how we can support, it can be really um, quite helpful. So from here, I've got there's lots to talk about on this, but here I'd love to open it up to a couple of questions from Diana and Lori to see if there's anything that rings true for you or any questions that you have. Yeah, Christine, this was really great. I think you just summarized it 
uh, exactly what we've been feeling uh, really with our teams. And uh, I was wondering, like, how can you really create that more psychological safety within a team? And I know mm -hmm. you did mention a couple of, let's say, ex examples and, and tools that you use, but uh, really how you create that, that safety net for the team to feel heard and, and vulnerable and, and secure. Sure. So, so there's a, I think there's a bunch of things, but one of the things that some people have tried, and, and again, this is like research, research shows that when first a lot of, um, in a lot of these studies, managers went to teams and asked for critical criticism, um, like ask the team to say, what do you think my problem is? You know, what's my weakness team? Um, and that didn't work in the long term, actually. It, managers felt defensive and they actually didn't know what to do with that information. But what was shown to have long-term um, positive side effects is when managers share um, openly and vulnerably what the constructive criticism they've received in the past. So I am working on, let's pretend you say, I'm working on understanding um, the technical details of this, this particular service that we offer. Um, because that's new to me. So that's one of my goals. And then sharing your learning goals around it. When, when leaders demonstrate that vulnerability and they normalize it, so, because all of us have stuff to work on, right? When you demonstrate vulnerability, you normalize it and you share it with your team. That has been proven to have long-term positive side effects. It's not a one-off though, you have to do it. So even if it's monthly development goal review. And then one other thing I'll share is I created, um, a user manual um, when I started, and I, I've shared this with almost all my team. I have to actually share it with new, some new starters. But this is really a personal user manual that talks about my, um, my preferences, my work styles. I included some of my psychological assessment, workplace assessments that I've done. Um, I talk about my things I, when I'm stressed out, what I need help with. Like what, if I'm really stressed, how you could best help me. How do I like to be communicated? Is it Teams? Is it email? Is my door always open? Am I flexible? So that my team knows how they can best deal with me. And then I encourage, though I didn't make it requirement, my team to, to create their own user manuals to share with me. Like, Christine, please don't, um, you know, spring, spring something on me with five minutes notice. You know, like some people are much more methodical. Some people are much more free flowing. So I encourage that. And I found it's been, some people really quite love it. They, they found it a very personally and sort of enlightening experience to reflect on how they work well in the workplace and other people kind of avoided it. So I just thought, you know, you don't want to do it, don't do it, but here's mine. So you can know how to function with me. And hopefully that would be helpful. So those are a couple examples. Oh, great, great examples. Thank you for sharing. Thank you. Thanks, Christine. That was that was interesting. I actually wrote down your listening between the lines. That's a, a quote I'm sure I will attribute to you and use because it does mm -hmm. ring true for especially when we're communicating in this format where you're not getting all of the uh, the body language and pieces. That's, yeah. uh, that's a good tip. Now, just so you've set up this psychological safety for your team. How mm -hmm. what happens when you're onboarding somebody new? How do you communicate that? that sense without starting from the ground floor again? How do you bring them on board and, and explain that culture? Yeah, you know, good question. And I think I'm working on that right now. We've had a couple people start and I think my go-to move is usually just addressing it straight off. Like saying, you know, I really, this is something that we really subscribe to is creating a culture of psychological safety where we trust each other. We have each other's back. We work as a team. You don't have to be scared to, um, you know, in your first three months here that um, we're going to put you on the spot or expect too much. We've been, we all have each other's back. We're learning from each other. So I think sometimes it's as simple as just saying like, you know, this is something I'm really working on and it, it seems to be working for our team and, and, and here's an article on it. Um, and you know what, I haven't done that with my new hire, so I, maybe I should. And then again, sharing that user manual to sort of start demonstrating and I think, again, it's through modeling. So modeling my own uh, vulnerability and openness and my desire to work in a learning culture that's always learning. So it doesn't like, I figured this out and I have it perfectly right. It's like, we're all learning all the time, all of us. 
And that allows us to change our minds, think again, um, revise, bring new ideas. So I think it starts by modeling and then praising people on your team publicly when they model those behaviors too. Um, and then, you know, that accountability too, like check in, creating that learning culture of like, what are we working on? Um, how can we improve this? Do you look at my presentation? Do you have any, I share proposals with my whole team and ask them to critique mine. So I think a lot of it's modeling and praising the behavior and then simply sharing the information. Great, thanks. You're welcome. Okay, so I'm watching the time and uh, I might've gone a bit over. So I am going to um, pass this over to my colleague, Diana, to take us through the next section. Great, thank you, Christine. It's actually like a perfect segue in, in like, you know, speaking about managing, you know, remote teams. And now we have, let's say, two teams. Now suddenly we have a new um, board, a, you know, partnership to board that where both teams are super excited. And uh, here we are working remotely. Now I had a chance to meet, really looking for that um, one shared goal shared vision, shared excited successful partnership to onboard. And here we are on, on Zoom teams and uh, suddenly we learn about, well, we look like to be, let's say in the, in the same time zone, even in the same city. And we do feel we talk different languages and uh, one team prefers to use Zoom over, let's say, Teams calls or Webinax and not familiar and not being able to join. So suddenly we, we start feeling really that um, instead now managing our own team, we have two teams. And where I find it like as a, let's say, as a leader, you know, that really designated the role of the leading multiple teams. And uh, you need really to speak the language of two different teams and um, ensure that processes and cultures and similar across the teams and make sure that really understanding that impact of each teamwork as a whole of the partnership. And then in, in those efforts to be efficient, we sometimes I find that we just want to work, get done, ensure like onboarding is done. We end up using really fewer words to communicate really quick to write a very, it's very fast to write a quick email. And then um, really the such gravity can mean that the rest of the team waste their time trying to interpret those messages and, and then mis misinterprets them anyways. So uh, really what I find it is best is like not to have any assumptions and uh, um, managing two remote teams I think number one is to really communicate the intention very clear, like ultra clear. I call it like ultra, ultra clear. And no matter the medium, it's like if it, that takes to write a, a paragraph explaining, let's say the, the new set of, of, of goals or the weekly projects, that is faster, like that is still saves a lot of time than later piling 15 emails with different interpretations and different questions. And, and, and that's where I find as a leader of, of leading two different teams, it does take a bit more time in really paying very careful attention to the communication and really getting ultra clear. Um, so I think uh, Christine mentioned earlier about shared expectations. Um, let's say uh, that's where I find that onboarding two different teams in, in the remote environment and really managing the dynamics among the teams, the differences in communication styles, in, in culture, internal culture. Um, I learned that sometimes best is, and what really inspires and motivates both teams is really to see that those shared expectations, uh, like very clearly of each team. And, and really I find that that person really not only has to be a good communicator uh, herself, himself, but also has to be a really good translator in, in translating one team's expectations for another and, and vice versa. And really um, 
where we fi I find that um, having developed a plan really um, between both teams, getting to know the, let's say, the culture, the style, the preferences, and really taking the time to learn about each team, then really collaborate and working to develop a, a plan and a structure, I would say a preferred structure, what could really work best in terms of moving on with the communications. And I find that really, um, even like in terms of how, let's say, the projects progress among both teams. And quite often I learned that, oh, when we communicated that we're gonna be uh, giving the feedback, the one team says, well, we're gonna receive the feedback, but it wasn't communicated how they would like to receive it and when they would like to receive it. So what seems to be so simple on one part, on one team ends up to be a complete misunderstanding on another. And then that's not taken into consideration the time zones. <laughs> that what means for, let's say, April 28, midnight, our time, that means a complete different day in someone else's time. So that deadline also has to be very clearly added with the time zone abbreviation. So all the teams um, kind of very have very clear and ultra clear communication. Uh, I think, Christine, you touched a bit on the empathy, really, and uh, um, within the team, within the remote team, because right now that we have, let's say, our work brought into our homes, and really this, there is no such a thing as nine to five anymore working from home. Really, it's, it's more like, um, it's not like office nine to five, it's, it's, it's really around the clock, and now suddenly we found you know, having those meetings either in our kitchen or in the kids' rooms, and 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 really bringing the work to to the to the home. So, finding about talking about the shared empathy, where the empathy may be uh, within the team members that working remotely. I I find it, I really apply the same approach with both teams, because it's sometimes very everybody and as a team especially now that they have this uh, cohesive and um, shared expectation on delivering a task and they ensure they deliver and if god forbid another team was late suddenly there is like two different teams and two different camps and and who did not do on what and now they have the group of people to support them so i find that also as a leader and as a communicator is important to bring back that empathy to the other team uh, on either or, or both teams and then really explain what are the reasons that the other team may be delayed and, and really um, give it feedback on kind of being a translator communicator sometimes when the other team is not able to express the side to really make them feel maybe the team was working on another project that had the same deadline and therefore these changes have been made. I find that that really helps to also manage and, and, and really similar approach what we would do within our remote teams, working within two teams, but really looking at the team itself as an individual with the same aspects of, of really um, having that ear for the other teams, um, like a style of communication, way of communicating, and and really, and, and learning of of what their expectations were set, and maybe sometimes trying to help it and and go back and learn if if that was even addressed in the communication. So, uh, shared empathy, yes, it's super important, and uh, managing. Uh, I think both teams and including the dynamics of the teams. Um, I find that's quite often happens that really the team focuses on the short term goals and, and like, let's say, day to day weekly projects. And, and that's great. That's perfect, perfectly fine in, in, in let's say, tracking and, and managing the efficiency, ensuring the resources are addressed well. What I find is that really what helps to bring both teams together and really inspire them is really seeing that shared vision of the partnership or a goal of the project. 
that two different teams, let's say, are working on it. And really um, bringing back those teams to, to the shared vision and shared goals once in a while, and depending on the project, sometimes weekly, and really saying, well, uh, this is what we're looking to have at the end of the year. And because of of your team's contribution because of how well you work with the other teams. And, and that's where I find it really is helpful. And as a leader, you uh, need to be creative in, in how you bring back those shared visions uh, or let's say those shared goals uh, time to time. And uh, I'm sure Lori is gonna speak more um, in details about uh, those specific tools and what's really helpful um, to really um, visually see, because we, we quite often find that what people can see, sometimes really you cannot, if what you cannot imagine, we cannot see, and you cannot really feel or act on it. So visualizing the, 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 the goal of the partnership or success and working with both teams strongly on that piece I find it quite helps to motivate them and really seek that common goal and, and, and support for each other. Um, I find that, uh, yeah, so I leave Lori to, to elaborate more on those, on those great methods. Um, I'm pretty sure you, you may have questions, a few of them, or I could elaborate more on some section. I've got one for you, actually, um, Diana. You talked about some of the challenges uh, between leading two separate teams. What do you think is the biggest challenge that you've you've experienced? I'm, I'm curious if it's similar to the ones we're we're experiencing. Uh, yeah, great question, Lori. I find that th there are quite, like as we mentioned, few challenges. I, but I think the biggest one would be, and I couldn't stress enough, is a very clear communication with, um, let's say, between both teams or passing the information, really to not to experience that broken phone because, oh, mm. you know, like, let's say, and um, I find that having like identified um, a key contact person on both teams that is a good communicator and could really, like they know the team's culture quite, well, they know how to manage, let's say, the, the internal dynamics um, and, it's, and could be quite objective. Looks like I'm painting the perfect, <laughs> a perfect, uh, let's say, uh, leader picture. Uh, but yes, the communication skills should be um, beyond, and I, I would say, um, excel in really ensuring the success of working across different teams on one project let's put right. it that yeah i'm seeing a, a hearing a theme common theme between christine's um speaking comments and, and yours is they is that communication and having the small strong communicator there christine was talking about listening between the lines you're you're talking about making sure that telephone's not broken and um yeah i'll, I'll uh christine may have some questions for you so i'll hand it off but i'll, I'll carry, pick up that theme when when you're finished Sounds great, Lori. Uh, and I don't know, maybe I'm muting myself. Oh, that's okay. Yeah. Um, okay. Thank you. Thank you, Diana. So, just thinking, you're talking about two separate teams, two separate organizations. So, your organization managing a team on another in another organization. Um, when you've when you've gone off track from fair shared vision and goals, anything that would you could suggest to bring a two separate teams back. To, to shared vision and shared goals? Um, yeah, so, right. So it, it does sometimes, as we know, like the projects or let's say managing the teams and, and the team sometimes really um, may lose the track and, and, and then and bringing back to this shared vision, I think it's more like getting the why are we working together, right? Why do we need each other's support? Because together, not only we're stronger, but we ensure that the goal is achieved, the success is yeah. there. Because alone, you really can go, let's say, very fast. Together, you can go really far. 
And, and mm -hmm. that's where I find sometimes I look for those inspirationals where those tips to the team members could be given uh, to ensure a smoother, let's say, um, conversation, um, or maybe adapting also to each other's style and really uh, feeling that um, empathy and, 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 and really ensuring that each team do their best and that supports the goal. And that is the expectation, really to be open, do your best and uh, really work towards that one goal, the shared vision. Because that's what really is managing both teams uh, working on the same project. Uh, yeah, Thank I don't know. Uh, so just a, a brief, I could, again, I could probably speak more with like more detailed examples. And uh, I know Lori has some great methods to share. So I'll pass the floor to Lori. Great. Thanks, Diana. Um, so this is year six for me in, in leading remote teams. So I've learned a few tricks along the way, but I mean, it used to be quite a unique skill set, not so much anymore. We've all been honing those skills for the last, last year. Um, I had four years at ISAF leading a global remote team. So different time zones, um, different um, employee groups as well. And uh, now that I'm back at TRU, it's, uh, you know, suddenly I was here for a month and then we're, we're back to to remote to working from home. So that was a bit of, of a shocker, but um, at least this, an unexpected skill set that I had to bring to the table actually. So we're kind of, we're at, we're at that point now where I feel like um, in the beginning it was, it was unique for some people to be able to work from home. And it was, and for some, it was kind of a welcome experience as well. But I feel like now um, the novelty is wearing off a little bit. So as Diana mentioned, we're, you know, we're working from the kitchen table, maybe with a, a spouse or children or, you know, so it's, it's really tough to create those boundaries between your, your office space and your, your personal space. So now it's, you know, we're a year in or over a year in working from home, most of us. So, you know, is it more of the same now? Do we keep on that same path of what the way we've been coaching our teams or, or do we mix it up? And I think, um, you know, if we re reflect on some of those things that we've been doing all year long, I, you know, things like, you know, for me, I, you know, I've always done this with my team. I log in at a certain time. I always say, post a good morning message, you know, even if we're not in the same time zone, it's just a clear um, indicator that I'm signed on and, and ready to, to hear you. It's not that I'm not available other times, but it just, it just sets that expectation that um, yeah, that I'm working and that you're going to hear from me at this time every day, right? So if there is specific working hours in the team and, and there's not always, um, that just models the behavior that I would like to see. We know that we only have, especially when we're working across time zones, so many hours when we're all working at the same time. So it's really nice to be able to rely on, on the team that they're going to be on and, and ready to work in those hours and available. So that's something that I've always done. Um, scheduled meetings. So, and that's something that the team relies on to, to know that, okay, Tuesday at this time we're, we're meeting. What it also does is, especially if you give a large block of time for that, is that it gives the team an expectation of, okay, we're going to have time to talk about these issues. It cuts down a little bit on those, that constant emails or, or texts that may not be time sensitive. So, you know, we all have that employee that's going, I have an idea, let's, <laughs> let's talk about this. Well, let's talk about it in our weekly meeting, we'll set outside some time to do that. And that's some, you know, behavior that, especially in an online environment, when we don't have the, the clear indicators when you're in a meeting, for instance, or on the phone. Um, so in a virtual environment, it's, it's a little harder to determine when somebody's available, but they know that they've got the time to do that in those areas. Um, the, the other piece that I would say, you know, that we certainly want to keep and continue with this year is the, is keeping track of the projects and having um, something, even if it's just a Excel spreadsheet to, to keep track of, of every project that's there and set some expectations of, of when they're due. So I think we've, we've spent the year kind of trying to keep the team productive to transition them from a face-to-face -face environment to online, making sure that the job is getting done. But I think we're now at that point where we can look at, at setting some goals that, you know, so that we're not just 
just moving forward, we're, we're actually um, being proactive, setting the goals that we want to achieve this year, even though we've got 10 other unexpected things thrown at us. <laughs> it's, uh, we, can, we can know that we're going to achieve our goals that we set forward. So, so models um, for this, I find are really helpful. One of the things that I've always done with my teams is, um, is assessment models. So I actually am going through this with my team right now, setting the, the annual goals. But um, I use a, it's, it's called a capability maturity model actually. And it's um, Peter Bushimi adapted this for marketing assessment. So I used to speak about digital marketing assessment. Um, some of my colleagues on the panel have, I'm sure, heard that, <laughs> that conversation before. But what I'm finding is that this model can be adopted for, for any team or any process or project. So right now, you know, I'm leading a team in partnership development. So to be able to, to pull out those pillars of key things that processes that we need done and to be able to assess where we are in that. Now, if we do it as a, from a team perspective too, then we've got a shared vision that we could move forward on. And Christine talked about creating a safe place. So, so this isn't about saying, hey, you're not doing this, this piece of your job well. It's not about that at all. It's about what areas do we have to complete in this process and what resources do we have and where do we need to focus our attention to get us all to this goal and it's not certainly doesn't happen on an individual basis it's a you have to set the stage with your team before you do it so that they understand that it's it's not an opportunity to to uh, point fingers by any means it's it's let's get on the same page and uh, and see where we're at so the way it works and, and actually if you just google um, marketing assessment models, you'll get uh, Peter Bushimi's model. It was adapted actually for software development processes. So it's got quite a range in it, but, but what it does is it gives you a, a qualitative and quantitative way to assess um, what's happening within your team. So you can, you basically go from, um, you rank each of your processes. So you can say you have a spectrum of how a task is, is happening. So I'll give you an example of that. So say for instance, for partnership development, it might be partnership communication. It might be the speed in which we get an agreement um, you know, signed and out the door. It could be the marketing process to promote that partnership with, with another institution. Um, so to, so all of those things we would look at and rank and say, okay, are we doing this kind of ad hoc? Or are we really optimized? Are we doing this as well as we possibly can? <laughs> so, in the uh, so so what you do is get each team member to assess that and say, okay, I'm going to give in, and I have spreadsheets for this as well that I can share. But you would give it a score from one to five on whether or not from the ad hoc to the optimized, and everybody would come together and we'd talk about that. So, and we'd also talk about what the challenges are. So if it's the communication with the partner, maybe it's an awkward time zone and we haven't set aside that time in our calendar to really reach out to that partner and speak to them more frequently. So is that something that we can do? Probably, probably quite easily, right? Some other pieces might be the, you know, the marketing piece or for instance, um, putting on a press release when we've got a new partnership in place, that might be out of our control. We might not be able to do that within our own group. We might rely on a central communications or marketing team. And in, in this is actually works really well in our institution, but I know that's not the reality for everybody, but to be able to say, okay, what are our challenges and how can we make this happen on a more uh, frequent basis? So you, you look at each of those pieces, you rank where you're at, and then I, I actually plot them on a spider chart as well so that we have a visual of our areas that we need to be improved upon. And, uh, and then suddenly we're, we're in a position where we're all kind of rowing in the same direction because we've all agreed as a team what our goal is for the year. And, so, and sometimes, you know, you might rank something as low, we, we don't do this well, but it, but you have to look at the importance too. It might not be important to do that one task well. So we don't want to put all of our energy into something that, that isn't, isn't as important for our day-to-day -day business. So for me, the, the assessment models, those type of tools where we're really looking at the goals, because I think we can spend a lot of time, especially in this online environment, just, just on the wheel, getting things done 
but not being um, proactive and progressive in, in where we want to get to. So that's um, certainly one area that I would say um, if, you know, if anybody's interested in learning more, I'm happy to, to share that, but it's, um, it's one way that to move forward. We, most uh, organizations have goal metrics in place. So you would have those conversations with your staff on where they want to be. But I think we're in a unique situation where suddenly we're using technology different. We're, we're performing our day-to-day -day jobs in a different way than we have before. So part of what I'm asking my team right now too is what do we want to keep from this unique experience and how can we build it in when we go back to, to working uh, in a face-to-face -face environment? Is there certain meetings that we could do this way in Teams or Zoom that would be more uh, efficient than trying to book a boardroom and getting everybody in this in the same place so things like that that we're we're exploring right now conscious of time so i'm going to leave it there are there questions from my colleagues sure um i love the um model that you shared forget the name i've seen I, i've attended some of your workshops um on this but um, I'd love to get that tool and um, can see so many uses with the team. Is there any other very specific tools that you'd recommend? For keeping the, the team on track, I don't think that it matters so much on the tool as much as it does having a tool. So okay. for, for instance, um, Trello is one that I, I've mm -hmm. used in the past and I, and I use now. And it, you know, if you're not familiar with it, it's basically post-it mm -hmm. notes in an electronic form. You, you, you're nodding, you've probably seen it, but yeah. um, it's yeah, it just allows you to to create, uh, especially if you're a creative or visual. You you know you post them on the desktop. You can create a vision board with your tasks, but it also incorporates lists and you can check things off the list, which is really gratifying. Or assign a post-it note to somebody else. So it's kind of a um, more creative way for project management instead of a, a straight Excel sheet. But I do think the key is for everybody to, to use it. And that, that was tough actually in, in this last, um, when we were first sent home is getting everybody to kind of log their projects and, and agree to what that software was. But once we've done it, it's just, it's normal now for everybody. And it's, you know, it's predictable. It gives people some um, processes in their day-to-day -day right now. Great, thank you, Laurie. Okay. Yeah, that's that I also wrote it down. You you mentioned Peter Bushimi, right? Uh, was yeah. the one that, perfect. So Lori, yeah. uh, uh, I knew you back then when you you know were working prior COVID, right? Uh, remote, and you were managing remote teams across the globe. And uh, like, really, how has working from home um, during COVID has been different to let's say the years that you you worked before, right? Because for you, COVID or no COVID, probably not much changed, right? That's a good question, actually. It's, uh, you would think, not a lot of change, but but the scenario was quite different because at ISAF, the team was built on a remote structure, right? We And we would see each other several times a year. So you'd you'd have these very intense times of, of working together face-to-face, -face, usually at an ISAF event. So it's, you know, where everybody's quite busy, but you do have that, um, that time to spend together. Uh, and the rest of the time you're you're entirely online so it is just second nature to have your earbuds in your ear and be cooking dinner or <laughs> whatever across time zones but for the team at TRU it was this was new they were all used to working out of an office so suddenly to have the team sent home with no experience working remotely and not understanding kind of how that would work um, I think the biggest challenge is that we thought it was, was temporary at first, right? It was, you know, this is going to be a month or two, and then it just kept going on and on and on. So what I, there were certainly some unexpected pieces that I've, that I've seen, for instance, my one team, and, you know, I have, I have three at the university, but the one team were really reluctant to working from home every week. They're like, when can we go back? When can we go back? They're just so used to that work or that group dynamic. I had another team that still is happy to work from home and, and could do it quite well um, moving forward. But it's it's the uncertainty that I think is, is still a bit of a challenge. Um, we've developed a, a skill set absolutely so that we can we can do the work and i'm sure that things will change when we go back face to face in terms of, of how we conduct meetings and, and retain partnerships etc 
but but it certainly was a shift between those two teams when you start a team knowing that they will always work remotely versus having a team that's used to working face to face and the uncertainty of when they can go back. And that's that's interesting, right? So good. Thank you. You're welcome. Christine, okay. I think you're on mute. That's one of I the most on mute. 2020, yeah. I think, <laughs> phrases. Yeah, yeah. It's with that print, you're muted, right? <laughs> yeah, yeah, yeah. Um, so thank you both. I'd like to thank everyone. Um, if there's uh, no more questions, I think we will wrap things up today. Um, I'd like to thank um, both Lori and Diana, as well as GloEd and M Squared Media for sponsoring us today. Um, we look forward to seeing you soon. Please reach out if you have any more questions about membership um, or just want to say hello and follow us on LinkedIn, Facebook. So thank you everyone and enjoy the rest of your day. Great, thank you.